I'd like to acknowledge our elders past and present, elders from other cultures, and also um, Aboriginal people with us today. So welcome to all of you on this uh, really beautiful land um, here in Victoria. I'd like to acknowledge and thank WorkSafe as a major sponsor of today's launch um, of the Residential Care Sector Occupational Health and Safety Capability Program. Now that's a, that's a tongue twister. I'll try and shorten that as we move forward, but a very important landmark day for all of us. I'd like to acknowledge the program is supported by WorkSafe and the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Welcome to today's event. Uh, note that there are over 300 registration registered participants. We've already got, uh, I can see, nearly 170 attendees on this on this Zoom launch, um, and people are still coming in. This has demonstrated a high level of focus on this important work. Welcome to the sector CEOs, workers, team leaders, um, all sorts of people from across our gorgeous sector here today um, at this important launch. So just a bit of housekeeping. Here we go, and it's up on this slide. Um, it will be recorded. We've already had some questions about that. The recording and presentations will be available on the, on the centre's website. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. We're all very used to that now, so please do that, and it will help us um, manage any questions. If we can't get to them today, we'll certainly get back to you after this session um, and get back to you after the launch. It's important that um, you participate in today's launch. It isn't just a sort of passive sit there and listen. Um, there will be a two minute survey we'll send out um, for you to evaluate uh, the launch in the following session. Um, this will help us improve um, how we're doing things in both content and logistics. So please make sure you complete them. Uh, the program, um, the, this WorkSafe and DHHS and Centre program is about safety of workers in residential care really important that every one of us are ambassadors around keeping people safe in the workplace. We might pop to the next slide now, Oliver. Thank you. Um, so up on this screen, this is where you get to participate throughout this whole session. Um, log into Slido, the event number is on your screen. We would like you to participate in this webinar fully, uh, as I said before. Um, we've prepared three questions um, and we'd love to get your thoughts on those questions. So um, you'll see this, this uh, number and log in all the way through these slides. So please log in and answer those questions. If we can get to your responses uh, with, a, with a visual towards the end of this session, we will, um, but certainly we will be able to collect that information. It'll help inform the program we're rolling out over the next couple of years. The questions will be, what do you think zero tolerance of workplace violence means? What should change in your workplace occur to make it safer? safer? And what are some of the benefits of changing our behaviour and attitudes towards occupational violence and aggression? Survey questions will in, in include event experience, usefulness of toolkit, toolkit materials sent out to participants, as well as um, uh, this pro the program of work. Um, so, please take some time to fill in those questions. So just in terms of the proceedings today, it's, it's two hours of jam packed events, as you can see on this slide, I'll quickly run through it. Um, we're delighted to have Colin Radford, the CEO of WorkSafe with us today, who will speak to us about why everyone deserves to be safe at work and the importance of this partnership. Our sector CEOs, my colleagues, Dr. Robin Miller, Paul McDonald, uh, Michael Perusco and Professor Muriel Bamblett will discuss why this program is so important. So a fantastic panel. Angela Porus, a program manager of Eastern Residential Services on what it means to the workers in the sector. We'll, I'll also have a chat, quick chat with her. And, and I'd like to also acknowledge the working relationship with the Australian Services Union and particularly Leon Wingard, who will um, be part of our steering committee for this important work. He's um, been an important ally and friend um, and it's a pleasure to work with Leon. We'll also have Agiri Alexandratos, the Deputy Secretary of DF DFFH, will speak to key actions and initiatives uh, to drive improved services and outcomes in residential care. And then the second part of this launch, we'll have a, a, a fantastic speaker, Dr. Tony Cardan, who's a senior ergonomist ergonomist, I knew I'd get that wrong, um, at WorkSafe, who will present on applying a systems framework 
in addressing occupational violence and aggression in the residential care sector. So I urge you to stay on for that um, if you have the time this morning. Um, that, that will be fantastic for people to, um, to hear. So before I, I want to hand over to Colin, who's a great colleague and friend, um, I would like to make some opening remarks. So if I could just have the next slide. Thank you. For children and young people in residential out-of-home care, uh, residential care houses are their home. They're also a workplace where residential care workers can be vulnerable to occupational violence and aggression. And there's been a growing recognition of the increased levels of occupational violence and aggression um, in residential care. The impact on workers and the need to actively support workers, managers, leaders and the sector to prevent occupational violence and aggression. And these slides are just a, a bit of a pictorial um, for all of us who, um, who know the landscape we're in. Uh, residential care um, is an out-of-home care accommodation and support service for children who are removed from their family and unable to live with them. Many of these children come into care with um, a range of issues that need addressing. Um, and often four of these children live together in a residential home. And for the most part, residential care is provided by uh, our not-for-profit providers here in Victoria and also our Aboriginal controlled organisations, our ACOs, on behalf of the Victorian Government. The next slide, please, Oliver. Just another snapshot here, but th th this, is, this is the crux of it. Uh, there are approximately 7,200 client on worker OVA incidents across the four largest providers. Um, and this data is from um, March 2020. Worker compensation claims have increased by 24% uh, compared to 4% across the social services sector. Residential care sector accounts for 9% of all the mental injury claims um, in the social services sector over the past five years. Um, with an increase in 47% in the last in the last year, um, and 18% of all workers' compensation have an OVA component compared to 5% for the broader sector. And 598 um, response visits um, we had to residential care by WorkSafe within the past five, five years, with up 167 response visits in 2019. Now this data is startling, and it's one of the reasons that Colin and myself um, and Aguirre um, thought that it was imperative that we do something about it. You know, you 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 know this data. You maybe don't know these numbers, but you know this data, and it's compelling and urges us to do something. The next slide, thank you, please, Oliver. So it's just a bit of an overview of the program that we're launching today. It's a two-year program comm commencing early this year. It's a strategic partnership in between the centre. WorkSafe and the Victorian Government to address violence and aggression against residential workers. The aims of the program to improve the health and safety outcomes of, resi of our residential care sector by building um, leadership capability, understanding strategies to prevent OVA across each level of the residential care system and changing cultural attitudes towards OVA. These things sound simple. We're only at the beginning of this. Um, it's exciting nonetheless to be in a position to name it up and start the process of change. So it's a very exciting time. Thank you, Oliver, the next slide. Okay, so now I get to um, introduce, um, introduce Colin. Uh, today, we're pleased to launch this program uh, that WorkSafe, the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, and importantly, my community sector and Aboriginal controlled organisation colleagues are supporting to build capability, specifically a safety leadership framework, then to, to create practical prevention tools for the residential care workforce so they feel supported, safe um, and cared for. Today is about taking the first step in saying no to occupational violence and aggression in residential care. And this is the first step in a significant cultural shift in attitude and behaviour in addressing occupational violence and aggression. So Colin was appointed um, to uh, the Chief Executive of WorkSafe in November 2019. Colin has a 30 year career working in and with the public sector, including as the CEO of the Victorian Management Insurance Authority, or VIMIA. Colin has spent seven years as a partner at Deloitte, where he led the Victorian government's practice and was the national public sector leader for financial advisory services. Reference, um, it's been, uh, you know, really fantastic uh, to uh, 
get to know Colin over time. I've sat on boards with Colin um, and, um, and really he's been um, fantastically accessible on this issue um, and um, I, I'm eternally grateful. So without further ado, Colin, I would like to hand over to you and thank you for assisting us to start this journey um, with WorkSafe and DFF to address these vital issues for workers. Thank you. Um, thanks, Deb. It is, um, it's fabulous to be here. And um, as Deb mentioned, we have um, known each other for a number of years and served on boards together. And I can absolutely say with all um, sincerity and honesty that, that in terms of uh, a very strong voice and advocate for the most vulnerable in our society. I think Deb, you know, Deb is unparalleled in that respect in the, the effort, the commitment and the passion she has for supporting those who most need our support and those who support those who need our support. So um, thanks for the introduction, Deb. It is, it is a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all of the lands that we're meeting from today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm currently on Wadawurrung country and I offer my thanks to their elders and all First Nations people for allowing me to walk with you on your land. I'm very pleased to join all of you for the launch of what is a first in its kind partnership between WorkSafe, the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare and the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. WorkSafe is really proud to be part of our first joint initiative, the Residential Care Sector OHS Capability Research Program. We believe this program will make a real and tangible difference to the safety of residential care workers, who for far too long, as, as the stats and the, um, the material that Deb just presented has shown, uh, for far too long have been at risk of occupational violence and aggression, also known as OVA. Residential care workers provide a critical service, offering specialist care and support to some of the most vulnerable children and young people in our community, many of whom have experienced unimaginable trauma in their young lives. The calling, the, the vocation, the commitment and the humanity of these workers is nothing short of inspiring. And just, just as they are advocates for the needs of the children and young people in their care, so too are we all here today as advocates for these workers to ensure their health, safety and well-being as they deliver these critical services. On that note, I would again like to thank Deb and her team at the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare, who will lead the program uh, in its, in its um, development um, and the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. I'd also like to thank the representatives from the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, as well as my colleagues from WorkSafe uh, for your expertise and your contributions to get us to where we are today. And importantly, I'd like to thank all of you that are joining us from the industry and from the sector. I know we have a number of chief executives, health and safety representatives and other senior leaders on the call today. And I thank all of you for your commitment to the health, safety and well-being of your workers and your colleagues and for the role that I know you will play in the prevention of occupational violence and aggression in your workplaces. At WorkSafe, we know the impact of occupational violence and aggression on a worker's mental and physical health only too well. Unfortunately, this is not a new workplace hazard or area of focus for WorkSafe. We've seen it in many industries, but certainly in emergency and frontline services, where workers are dealing with the care and support of people who are in a vulnerable state. And we know that it is one of the main risks to health and safety that residential care workers face. We see this in the number and severity of reported incidents, increasing claims rates, the high number of visits that our inspectors have undertaken and the notices issued in relation to occupational violence and aggression. You may recall a few years ago, that WorkSafe launched a public awareness campaign targeting OVA in the health and social assistance sectors, highlighting the risks that nurses, paramedics and aged care workers face on an all too frequent basis. Alarmingly, up to 95% of healthcare workers have experienced verbal or physical assault, and yet only 2% will ever report it. Now those statistics speak to some of the biggest challenges that we have and that we still need to overcome in this sector. 
the often long held and at times entrenched belief that experiencing acts of violence or aggression is, sometime, is somehow just part of the job. Um, that workers' safety comes second to the safety of those in their care. That workers or witnesses don't feel safe and supported to report incidents or near misses immediately and are not confident that they will be investigated as part of an appropriate response or that steps will be taken to prevent future incidents. And also the need for ongoing awareness about what occupational violence and aggression is and how to call it out and ultimately prevent it. Because OVA actually describes a broad spectrum of behaviours, everything from facial gestures like sneering, eye rolling, to verbal abuse, and its worst, physical assault, and everything in between. And perhaps the greatest challenge of all, reinforcing that this kind of behaviour is never okay, no matter the sector or the situation. Putting worker safety at the forefront and making it a priority ultimately leads to better quality care for clients. And that's why it's so important to, vote, to focus on prevention and early intervention. Through the program we're launching today, we aim to drive industry-wide behavioural change that leads to employers prioritising the health and safety of their workers, sees a reduction in injuries and illness, and improves the way in which workers are supported to return to work following an injury. Led by the centre and with the support of WorkSafe and the Victorian government, this two-year program will focus on a number of key areas. Building safety leadership capability and an OVA prevention framework specifically tailored to the residential care sector. This framework will identify the capabilities and strategies that are required to create a psychologically safe workplace and prevent OVA at each level of the system, including CEOs, HSRs, executive leadership teams, boards, managers, and supervisors. Designing, piloting, and rolling out a safety leadership program to build safety leadership capability and OVA knowledge across all levels of the system with tailored modules for those target groups I just mentioned. And designing, piloting, and rolling out an OVA prevention program for frontline workers to change those ingrained attitudes towards OVA and build practical strategies and skills for prioritising their own health and safety while providing optimal care to their clients. It's also fantastic to see some of our largest community service organisations in Victoria have volunteered to be part of this program rollout. And I want to thank you because I know many of you are on the call today. Finally, I'm confident that this program and our partnership will serve as a demonstrable example of what we can achieve for workers when we work together towards a common goal. And that work starts today. Today, we lay the foundations for healthier, safer workplaces for residential care workers now and into the future. I'm also excited about, work, about what WorkSafe might be able to learn from this research program and how it might be applied to other priority health and social assistance sectors, such as disability and aged care. I'm sure you will get a lot out of hearing from the many specialists and experts who will present today. And like me, I'm sure you will also be interested to follow the progress and the outcomes of this program over the coming years. Again, I would like to thank you all for your ongoing commitment to safer workplaces in this sector, workplaces free of occupational violence and aggression. And I thank you for your time and for allowing me to join with you this morning. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Colin. Um, fantastic words. And again, I just, um, um, I know we met not that long ago uh, to talk about this and I just want to uh, say this is a, an important day for us and um, your support um, I know how much this matters to you, your support on this uh, and bringing us, the sector, D I, I keep wanting to call them DHHS, DFFH and WorkSafe together on this really important initiative show, will sh does show our workforce that they, they matter. Uh, and I know how much that means to you. So thank you so much, Colin, really appreciate it. And look forward what's gonna, to what's going to come out of this. So thank you. 
Now we um, we move on to um, our esteemed panel. As as Colin referenced, um, he's really really happy to see uh, some of our biggest residential care providers here with us today. And I, I'm I'm not going to tell you who they are because they're up on this screen. Uh, but we we really have a fantastic panel. I think this just shows the level of support there is for this for doing something about this issue um, in our sector. Uh, and important to know uh, having uh, my colleagues here today uh, uh, rep, you know, we have Muriel, Professor Muriel Bramblett here today this is a CSO and ACO joint initiative we're very very lucky um, so what I'm going to do um, is um, move very quickly into a bit of a discussion because we don't have a lot of time and I know you'll want to hear from um, from our colleagues but what, where I'm going to start is I'm going to start with Angela Porus now Angela you are a residential care manager with Angler Care, and we are very grateful to have you here with us today because actually um, you are with your team at the coalface of, of running residential care services. And we thought we absolutely need an Angela here today to talk about what an initiative like this means and some of your reflections about the work ahead, um, what we need to really think about. So Angela, over to you. Thank you for being here. Nice to see you on the screen. Thank you. Um, and really, um, I think for the, the nearly 240 people here today, really interested in your, in your insights. Yes, so thank you for having me here today. Um, I first wanted to say that I'm, I'm happy to be here today to talk about occupational violence and residential care in the workspace. Um, I have to start by saying that resi youth workers are amazing. I don't know how many of you are here today, but if you are, you should know. And I know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. Uh, you guys, resi workers play a significant role in a young person's life, uh, often one of the last remaining connections relied upon to provide support and safety and a stable home for young people before they exit care. How you guys engage and respond to their trauma-based behavior in a lot of ways shapes how they're going to form their relationships later in life. And when I think about the expectations of our workers to promote safety in young people, I think what's been missing for a while is the understanding in how order in order to feel for, for safety to be taught, the ones teaching need to feel safe when they come to work as well. It's important that we pay attention when they say they don't feel safe and respond accordingly. Um, there's often a perception on a culture that's that this is the nature of the job. Um, because it's not because we think it's how it should be, it's just because it's admittedly been a difficult space to navigate through, and in turn, our staff have been impacted. It's important for our staff to feel validated and heard and to understand that their overall health and well-being is a priority. They also need to feel okay to be able to report um, the violence that occurs in Resi, as, as I mentioned before, um, that not a lot of people do, or there hasn't been as much of a, of a reporting as it should be. Um, I guess overall, I remember attending a forum at McKillop Family Services back in October 2019 to discuss how we as a sector can prevent and manage risk associated with occupational violence in, in Resi care. Uh, with a focus on the impact of exposure to violence and aggression to our frontline staff. And I'm just excited to see because it, it included a shared learnings from many participating organizations here today. And I left excited feeling that, that this was going to be discussed, but wondering where we go next. So as you can imagine, I'm glad to see that work has continued to go forward and into this and, and that we're going to be seeing a strategic plan moving forward. So I'm looking forward to how uh, we can support our staff in this space as well. Thanks. Angela, thank you so much for your insights. And uh, I want to join with you to say, I think the workers in our sector are amazing and incredible. And um, and, uh, and I know there are many of us, that many of them joining us here today and who um, along with all of us are really happy to see that we're all doing something on this. So thank you so much. So we might now pop up um, the if, if if you don't mind, thank you. Here are the questions. Now, we set a huge challenge for our panel because there are a number of questions here, but we're going to have a bit of a free-flowing conversation. Now, um, as always, um, the amazing, intrepid Professor Muriel Bamblett has written like written us a bit of a blueprint uh, last night and sent it to, to me. She's always working, working at midnight, um, as was I. So she told me to go to bed. Uh, but I, I really want to hand to uh, Muriel um, because I think that um, as always, and I'd have to say in the last seven years I've been at the centre, we respectfully 
learn so much from our Aboriginal colleagues about these issues. Uh, and in briefing and talking to Muriel before this session, um, her ideas just were just incredible. So Muriel, I want to hand over to you because I want you to say what you want to say. I'm not going to ask you a question. I want to hear from you. The the 240 people want to hear from you um, about what you think, um, what, you know, in terms of um, what the ACOs are already doing um, and where you want to go with this and the sorts of things you want to see come out of this. I'm going to hand over to you to hear from you for the next few minutes. Yeah, um, thanks. And thanks, everybody. I think um, I just want to firstly congratulate the centre um, for taking up the work of this campaign and all the membership. I think um, we know that um, residential care, we've been failing a lot and we, we understand that we've got to do a lot more work. I, I have to, you know, join Angela in saying congratulations to the workers and the, and the amazing job that they do every day. But I, I just think that on so many levels, we've got to improve the way that we work. And so, um, you know, firstly, thank you for the acknowledgement. And I do want to join and thank, you know, um, thank everybody for acknowledging us as traditional owners and a special status. And I think that this, this board, the people that I worked with every day demonstrate their commitment to self-determination and what that means. And I really appreciate that support. But I think what we've learned is our system is far from perfect. And I think a lot of the feedback that I've heard from our staff is that often in residential care, we get the kids too late. It's often the, the end of a, a very bad process of a lot of years of failed um, looking after children and, and they're seen as let's place them here because we don't have any other options. And so I think we've seen some children with it that they've been through 40 placements. So, I think if we're going to look at this, let's look at how do we actually um, hear the voice of young people and actually um, work much more closely, but also use the community for, for us in the Aboriginal community, men's business, women's business, cultural practices and engaging the community elders in our work, but we want them to do it for nothing. Um, we want them to come in and, and do all these things. And so I think, um, you know, like for me, the staff, basically said, we are so pleased that you're doing this. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a greater focus on just the violence. It'll actually be a greater focus on the treatment of young people. So thank you for the opportunity for speaking first. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Muriel. And, uh, you know, you touched on such a broad range of issues, and I think you're right. This project's going to be sort of a lightning rod for all of the things that... Um, we want to see change, um, sort of a bit of a, well, okay, let's get around this and focus on this properly. Um, so th thank you so much. I'm, I might I might go to, um, on my screen, I might now go to Paul McDonald from Anglicare. Hello, Paul. Good morning. Morning. Uh, morning, Deb. Morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Now, again, we had the three questions up on the screen, but I just want to get your overall impressions, Paul. Um, uh, this has been a long time coming, but we're here. Um, um, does this excite you, uh, or, or you know, or, or do you feel a bit in is a trepidation? Tell me what your thoughts are, because we're at the beginning of something pretty significant. Well, um, look, uh, let's cut to the chase. I'm bloody excited. Uh, I think this is very, very important. In fact. You know, I, I really welcome this launch and this uh, joint initiative. I welcome Colin's um, address and work safe. I welcome DFFH in this. And the reason why I'm so welcoming, Deb, um, is that um, we've been handling these things for, on our own for far too long. And, um, and for, for the first time now, this is a bit of a watershed moment. This is, this is the first step in a and possibly a culture change. So before I say a couple of comments, I want to recognise I'm on Wurundjeri Wurrung land and pay my respects to the elders, past and present. I also want to do a shout out to all the resi workers out there. We're uh, of the 240 out there. I'm, I'm sure a fair bulk of them are people who work every day and every every day of the year in, in a residential unit. I want to pay also acknowledge their, um, uh, their contribution to the lives of young people who find themselves in residential care. I mean, I think this is a collect, and the other reason why I'm excited, it's a collective webinar. And maybe to capture the phrase of the pandemic, uh, could I borrow that for this, for this purpose? We are all in this together. This issue of OVA in residential care, we are all in this together. 
and I think the training, the better awareness, the, the importance that this, uh, this two-year project will take will be very, very important. And along with that, I think we also have to um, um, talk about a number of things that are going on there that we probably have to look at it in the eye to what do you think is needed to make this happen for it to be successful as number two question is asked. And firstly, uh, we've got to have a real joint appreciation of the issues. Why? Because there is no joint understanding of the issues. There is not a joint understanding between the purchaser and provider in relation to OVA and what's going on. And secondly, we've got to, we've got to see residential care as a high-end, fully equipped placement experience or residential experience for young people. For our 440 odd or nearly 500 of Victoria's most challenged young people, that means that we've got to prioritise it as a placement of care, just like the hospital system does with intensive care and wards and, you know, they're parallel, walking to an ICU, walking to a ward, they're parallel universes. I think we should be starting to see residential care as a, as a, the same sort of way as a high end, fully equipped placement area. But, you know, I'll say this Deb, that um, to everyone out there, we chaired a residential care review. The minister, I co-chaired a residential care review with Aguirre, uh, requested by the minister. And we've got a number of recommendations in there. But can I go to the body of the report? That is the pros in the report, what the report said. And, and Whilst acknowledging the, uh, the, the new funding recently uh, that had happened with the budget and a number of other things in the last budget, it is a model in neglect, I'd have to say, in neglect for these reasons, that we actually have to prioritise the experience of the young person. We've still got 90% of our beds in the placement uh, sector uh, for bed. And, and so that raises three quick questions that I've got about what would be needed to make or to reduce the OVA assaults and incidents in residential care. The first one, we have a different assessment approach depending on where you're sitting. From a PCU, child protection, the placement of the child is first and foremost. From a provider like uh, myself, got about 30 residential units under our management, about five to 600 staff in and out of those places. There are three things that we take into account. The placement of the child, will it be good for them? The other three children, will it be good for them in the placement of the child? And as an employer, the consideration of our staff, Will it be good for them? Have they got the capacity? At the moment, we've got a system in which one part of the system asks one question, we need to place this child. The provider asks actually three questions because we're an employer. We've also got the existing children under our care and the same. We need to actually, there's a disconnect there and that's why we need a better joint understanding. Quickly, the last, the other two is that there's a lack of common culture. I think it's right that Angela and Muriel shout out for the residential cares. You know, staff are tremendously committed, hanging in because no one else has for these kids. Their commitment is heroic. However, hanging in, which the system loves from, the, from uh, these staff, does not mean copying a whack regularly, being threatened with your life periodor periodically, or being stabbed more than on one occasion. Where is the line drawn? Is it zero? Is it a little bit? Where is it? What is the unintended consequence of this? And so I don't think we have a, I think we lack a common culture in approaching this issue. And I, that's why I welcomed um, Colin and Aguirre's involvement with providers about what is collectively our common culture. And the final comment I'll make Deb is, are we prepared to pay for these young people? We have still a system in which 60% of our residential units have no one else on the floor coming in apart from residential staff. No therapeutic staff, no other staff, no family worker, no, no community education worker. 60% of our residential units have that. And as I said, 90% are, uh, are for bed. Until we prioritise to actually say, are we prepared to pay for these young people? This will have a direct correlation on our OVA incidents as well. There's a couple of opening remarks from me. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Paul. Um, now we're going to we're going to add add to that. I mean, I think that um, for those of you who are on this call, you can see the commitment. You can see and feel the commitment to get a change here, um, which is, you know, uh, really critical 
if we're going to realise some of the things we want to see happen for residential care. Now, I'm going to hand over to Michael, Michael Prisco, the CEO of Berry Street, to, to take us a bit further, Michael. What would your reflections be? I know that, um, I'm not sure how long you've been at Berry Street. It feels like a long time for me, but it's, a, it's probably a couple of years. And I'm reflecting when I think about you, Michael, of the early conversations we had and some of the, the things that you reflected on in your early days at being at Berry Street. And what does this initiative mean for Berry Street and for you, what you want to see happen? Thanks, Deb. Uh, nice to be here and um, hello to everyone. I'd like to acknowledge land as well and that I'm on uh, Wurundjeri country and I'd pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I, I think, um, this really boils down to a couple of things. Um, residential care, the, the way it is at the moment, it harms children and it harms staff. So that's, that's the starting point. And I think we have seen evidence of that in review after review, external reviews. The latest one was the Victorian Ombudsman report and we saw it in, we saw um, that, that assessment in the uh, review that Paul mentioned earlier on uh, that led to the residential care uh, action plan. I think it is absolutely true that residential care workers do their absolute best. And I think it is amazing what they contribute on a daily basis. I would also say very clearly that we have failed them. We've, we've failed them uh, as employers, we've failed them as a system and we've failed them as um, a society. And by failing them in supporting them to do their job well, we fail the most vulnerable kids and young people in Victoria. Uh, and that is the bottom line of what we're talking about here. We are failing what is a uh, largely lower paid workforce. Um, and on the back of that, we're failing the most vulnerable kids uh, in Victoria. So that speaks to the absolute importance of this pro project. Um, it speaks to the need for it to be a catalyst for change. I don't think you can look at this issue in any detail and come away except with the view that things have got to change and they've got to change in a big way. So I think the only way in which we're going to see real change here is for a fundamental reform of the system itself. I want to talk a little bit about zero tolerance for a moment because as Deb said, I've been here at Berry Street for a few years now and uh, we um, really started focusing on OVA about two and a half uh, years ago and putting a lot of work into raising, raising awareness um, of, of OVA. Um, and as a result, over that time, we've seen much greater reporting of OVA. So we, we now know that uh, we have about 350 instances of occupational violence each quarter. We know that um, 60 to 80 percent, sorry, 60 to 80 of, of those relate to punching, hitting, pushing, pulling, etc. Uh, that it and it ranges from verbal abuse. We also know that each quarter we have about five incidents. Um, uh, we have about five incidents where um, medic, medical treatment is required. Now there aren't many workforces where you can say that and it's acceptable. And for some reason, tolerance. Zero tolerance for violence because that harms workers. And the follow on, it harms, if there is uh, occupational violence in the residential care home, that is harmful to the young people. Those young people have often experienced a lot of violence in, um, in their lives. Uh, and this is a continuation of that violence. Um, I think what, what is also really interesting about um, increasing the awareness of occupational violence uh, here at Berry Street over the last couple of years is that it has led to increased reporting. It has led to staff wanting to actually uh, report because they see some value in it. Um, and it has led to increased work cover claims. 
um, because people are more aware of their rights and more more aware of what's acceptable uh, and and what's what's not. And zero tolerance means a different attitude um, from employers. It means a different attitude from staff. It means a different attitude from uh, work cover, and it means different attitudes required from uh, the department. And if we don't have that shared view of zero tolerance, um, then we're going to be uh, this 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 problem will just continue. So I think one of the things that I want to see, one of the main things that I want to see, the fund um, as a foundational piece here, is what does zero tolerance look like? What does that mean practically? Because the stats that I just talked about here at Berry Street are, you know, they can they are unacceptable and they continue to be unacceptable and uh, then they're, they're not that different from I'm sure other organizations um, and we need to do a hell of a lot better for the work for the staff and we have to do a hell of a lot better for the kids. Thank you Michael and um, that was really helpful and your perspective of, over being in Berry Street for a good couple of years now gives you some really really good insights. I do want to say the data stuff is really important and um, and one of the emphases of this project will be to really make sure that we've got good data so that we are talking talking apples and apples that we know what data we're collecting and that we can get some indication of things as they change over time. Now I want to go back to Muriel if we can Muriel and I just I, I just want to explore with you a bit more the cultural safety aspect of the ACO's work because we, we haven't had the chance to talk about that and I think that's actually um, particularly for, for lots of children but particularly for our Aboriginal children cultural safety being at the cornerstone of children being safe in care but also safe in the community community um, and, and also I wonder if you can just explore with us the role of children um, the role of ch a children's agency uh, within this project uh, to help get us to that sort of zero tolerance because you only got the chance to touch on that and I want to I want you to have a bit more time on those two things do you want to reflect on those a bit more for us um, I think in the space of cultural safety I'll be Thank you. Warning signs. Mute, mute, mute. Um, obviously, young people in residential care, and particularly for us um, in the Aboriginal residential care sector, often children come to us and they've had a history of not having their culture acknowledged, not being participating in the Aboriginal community, and there's a real disconnect. And I think we have got to comply with the Aboriginal child placement principle much earlier when a child even begins to. Um, hit the first hit the child protection system because um, a child of two or three doesn't care about their traditional culture. They don't care about being Aboriginal. They'll look at a boomerang and just bang it on the floor like every other. But by the time they're seven or eight, and by the time they're 15 and 16, if they haven't been, you know, had anything to do with their Aboriginal culture, they're they're acting out and so we know about therapeutic we know the importance of culture in, in in building resilience and we do all that you know paul's point about you know all of those services that will support young people particularly aboriginal young but most children have a cultural base not just aboriginal children and so we 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 take them into um residential care and presume they haven't got a cultural base at all and so i think we have to think about that but some of the things that, you know, particularly for Aboriginal children and, and young people respect, often we find that they've lost a level of respect for anybody. And that's really disappointing for us, you know, when dealing with Aboriginal young people, when they've lost the ability to respect themselves, respect the workers, respect anybody because the system they believe has failed them. And I think we've seen many, of, many times where children get failed and young people get failed. We have parents that say they're going to visit children, they're going to do things for children they don't do it. Workers say they're going to do so. For me, you see adolescents really acting out, but we, we need to, I think, therapeutically, we need to work with young people. But I also think we need to, like, when we think about the code, COVID and what that looked, taught us, how many images did we see of um, and responses to nurses and how what, how what sort of mark that left on us? Because we were to see um, the impact of COVID and people, you know, being angry because they couldn't see their parents, they couldn't see their grandparents. But in, in our world, that's some of what we experience, you know, like parents are angry because their kids have been taken 
And workers are dealing with that. They're not just dealing with the young people every day. They're dealing with systems that are failing. They feel that are failing. So workers don't only just deal with the things that are in the work in in the house with the children and the young people. They're looking at you know not not being able to access you know disability support, mental health, timely referrals, and so there's a sense of frustration. And I think it's really important to understand how all the pieces of this um, puzzle come together and how do we actually um, build a better residential care system and that workers have referral pathways with the advent of NDIS or NDIA, um, being able to get access to disability services for young people. Um, we had a workshop, we were talking yesterday about LBQTQTI and, and all of the children with, um, you know, that come from, that are diverse and how do we think about those in our residents? So I know I've put a lot more out there, but I think it does take, you know, system transformation. I think it is a reform. I love the word reform at the moment. And if we think about how do we reform, it's great to have this launch of this campaign, but if we're not about reform, then I think we may have failed. So thanks, Deb. With this. Thank you, Muriel. I just wanted, I mean, I, I think that um, in talking to you about this campaign, you gave us so many great ideas. So um, can't wait to have another conversation with you about those. And I think the comment about respect for children being able to respect themselves and respect the adults around them, I, I think that would resonate um, with most of the people um, on here today. Absolutely not their fault, but it just shows the damage the system the systems around them do. Now, we have the lovely uh, Robin Miller just joined us. Thank you, Robin. Good morning. Good morning, Deb. Can you now, hear me? We yeah. can hear you. Now, I know, um, because I work close, how important this issue is to you. Um, I know that you've um, you've been tirelessly engaging with WorkSafe on this issue. Um, we just um, um, most of the series have given some reflections about how important this piece of work is uh, as a bit of a cornerstone, a lightning rod for some of the change that we need to see in residential care to support our kids um, and to support our amazing workforce. So, and we've got the three questions up there, and we're just looking for your reflections, your thoughts. Um, what, you, what your hopes and dreams are from this piece of work, because we're only at the beginning of this in many ways. Um, there's lots to do. Thanks, Deb. Um, and Deb, just how long, uh, like five minutes or so? I'm just not wanting to go over time. Yeah, five minutes would be great. Pay my respects to the traditional owners and acknowledging that we all meet on Aboriginal land. So what, what um, I'm delighted that this project is front and centre and uh, it's, uh, it's you know, in some ways, um, many of us have been agitating for a long time and there is such a, 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 a leadership challenge where we, we know we are um, dealing with such high rates, unacceptably high rates of occupational violence. So um, what would a strong focus on OVA prevention look like in the workplace? I think that word prevention is the key. Um, and that is that we need to understand the kids and how we match them and all, there's no slick solution, I'll start there. I think we need, number one, multiple and concurrent actions. It's about how we, um, how we recruit, how we induct, how we train, and then how we support in an ongoing way the, uh, the amazing people who do this work. What I do know is that um, the uh, funding formula is not fair at the moment, and that is that only a third of the um, residential homes are funded at a therapeutic level, which gives that 0.5 clinician. And the first thing I said to our board when I got the job at MacKillop uh, was that ethically we need to, um, if we dare to do the work in residential care, knowing full well the impact on staff and other children who are exposed uh, to the dysregulated behaviours, the trauma-based, pain-based behaviours of the kids um, that, that do act out at times. Um, we need to be able to uh, predict, you know, we, we, the evidence is in on that. We need to build in more ethically a, a framework of support around them. So I can't stress enough the importance of supervision and clinical support of the teams inside every house. Um, it does come down to matching. We all know that and, and you know, I won't go into that anymore, but the, the sort of the daily sort of um, 
negotiations between you might have a very settled house uh, where kids are, are, are you know we're well engaged with staff and then a young person comes in who is so dysregulated and high on ice etc and bang you know a key person in the, a key carer in the homes assaulted uh, and then you get this very quick fragmentation of the culture within that house and the safety so at MacKillop, we're a sanctuary organisation. The bottom line about that is uh, is safety, you know, and being a trauma informed. Uh, so so that you have to have a, a strong commitment, a strong value base to understanding the kids, um, and also equipping staff with the right skills. So since I've been at MacKillop, we've we've actually doubled the training and the induction. Um, and I think, you know least trained staff often are dealing with the most complex kids for the longest period of time. So, you know, they can't be on their own. We need to build in those clinical people, visible leadership, coordinators sharing and being part of um, the, the, the ecology. I think um, we've um, used evidence-based, um, and I think this should be something that uh, we, we do share broadly, and that's EMDR, eye movement desensitisation reprocessing, where we have had much better results uh, in terms of recovery. So the response, you, if you think two sides of the coin, it's prevention and then it's responding um, ethically and skillfully to those people who've, um, who've been harmed. And, you know, as, as um, people running organisations, that, that natural law ethical position of do no harm as a basis, you know. So if somebody has been harmed, if they've been hurt, well, how do we respond? And we know that... Um, frequently our staff say the, um, the EAP is actually not as important as the direct support from their colleagues and from immediate um, uh, supervisors. We've built that in in a, in, a, in a systematic way now and that's having some positive feedback. The EMDR, I think, it's, it's one of the two evidence-based treatment um, processes for trauma. And um, we're actually investing with Monash in, in evaluating that now. We've, we've used that the last three years uh, with really good effect, getting the return to work numbers are much better. Um, and staff have overwhelmingly found that helpful. But what's been more helpful is the focus on supervision. And I think that's something around prevention where, where you have reflective practice for every house, not just a third of them. And um, the carers who, are the most important people in terms of the direct relationship-based practice with the kids. And that's the secret ingredient to shifting the outcomes for kids and helping them to regulate and calm. You know, how do you create a warm, welcoming, sort of loving environment in this home? So the key um, focus on um, supervision means that we've had to be much more rigorous about monitoring that. Um, expectations being really clear of, of how supervisors, coordinators, that supervision one-to-one -one uninterrupted does happen. So we record that electronic now, we audit it and, and the figures are public. So we've set up a resi governance group inside McKillop where we pull together all the data and we triangulate the data on incident reports, on um, OCH health and safety, on stability, the numbers of carers in each home, uh, supervision compliance, um, on a whole lot of other, whatever data we can get our hands on. And then rather than just sort of read it on a sheet, think about it deeply. So I think it takes an awful lot of um, committed, uh, you know, teamwork really, and, um, and commitment to sort of pull together that level of data and pull together the sort of concurrent practices, both, you know, at the supervision and the induction, therapeutic crisis intervention, TCI as it's called, uh, we, have, we mandate everybody do that. We, we undertook with WorkSafe, to, um, I think it was four years ago now, to um, not just the sanctuary model, but, pe but the feedback from staff was that the sanctuary model is great. It gives a, a baseline for everybody around understanding trauma, around red flag meetings, community meetings. It builds up teamwork, absolutely. Um, and we've, um, but we weren't evaluating it enough. So we've, we've now at the end of three years of two PhD students um, and the psychoed of kids, which is part of Sanctuary, the, the resources we've improved. So I suppose that commitment to in continuous improvement and really listening to the kids and to the staff. Uh, so those carers, frontline carers has been something that I think uh, will prevent it. And for Aboriginal young people, um, I heard some of what Muriel was saying, but the, the you know, it, the importance of family-based practice. So often the kids are acting out because of the cutoff 
and and as a system we haven't been proactive enough in the AFL DMs or the or the just contact with siblings you know who might be somewhere else or back to country um, but as um, agencies we're trying to um, be much more proactive uh, the, the critical importance it's not the optional add-on you know it's the lens through that that cultural identity and respect for culture and connection to culture is healing and how do we um, proactively, um, not waiting for child protection, but how do we drive that as a community of practitioners? So there's some immediate thoughts. I, I, you know, we're, we're a work in progress. We're blitzing it constantly. Um, you know, at MacKillop, there's no magic bullet. You know, it's just got to be. And I think I, I, I want to learn more about what other agencies are doing. And, um, and I'm very, very willing and happy to share whatever we're doing that might make a difference, but it's but it's it, it won't happen without a lot of energy and a lot of determination to stay on it day to day. Yeah. And then when you have a kid that's really acting out, deep dive review. So the outcomes 100 has been partly um, focusing on that and really thinking outside the square. Critical reflection: What have we tried? What's worked? What was the antecedents? When was the build up? What was the violence about? Um, and then, you know, um, using making decisions that are that are based on on that sort of in depth, nuanced um, understanding. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much for giving us some insights into what you're doing and how you're approaching it. You did say, you know, I want to learn more about what others are doing. I think that a big part of the focus of this project is going to be the sort of transparency about sharing about what we're doing so we can all benefit. So thank you for that, because I think that's going to be really important. We did so show some data right at the beginning. I showed some data about how seriously how bad things are in terms of the incident. So I think um, being able to demonstrate what's happening and the improvement we're able to make and why and what we need for that to happen, I think is going to be is going to be critical to share to share the the journey together. So um, on that note, I want to thank all of you, um, Angela, Michael, Muriel, Paul, and you, Robin, for um, a fantastic panel. We've just been able to run it a bit longer than I had hoped, which is always, always good. Um, and um, and I just want to say thank you so much for your, um, I suppose, you know, you making this a priority and for supporting the centre to be able to make it a priority um, over the next couple of years, because it is a lightning rod for change. And I think having the support of WorkSafe and DFF, DFFH on this is critical. Um, and without you, um, this just wouldn't be happening. And I know how much it matters to all of you. Um, before I introduce Agiri, um, I really just want to make a few quick acknowledgements. So I just want to acknowledge um, Natasha Good from WorkSafe, who worked um, with us and Taraya to get this project uh, funded and off the ground, but also uh, Michelle Chico, who we worked very closely in the then DHHS to get this project project off the ground. Um, these are people that worked very hard. This is a complex project with lots of people involved. Um, also, Minister Donnellan, who's very keen on this on this piece of work, and obviously my team, the two Emmas and Oliver. Um, so I'm now going to introduce um, Agiri. Um, you would have noticed we did put some of the Slido slides up. If we get time towards the end, we'll put more of those up. I'm hearing that there's an enormous amount of activity or happening on Slido responding to those questions. If we don't get to them, we will give you a report back um, after this meeting. So, all right, I'm going to head to Agiri now, who's um, we're very lucky to have here with us. Um, Agiri is the Deputy Secretary, Children, Families, Communities and Disability at the still very new Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Igiri leads the statewide policy and programs area for children, families, communities and disabilities. Um, this includes leading the major reform or transformation of the state's child and family services system, system under the Victorian government's roadmap to reform agenda, um, as well as the development of quality and safety infrastructure for community services across Victoria. Um, Many of our CEOs touched on some of the big pieces of work uh, that are going on, uh, the Residential Care Action Plan that, uh, that Paul co-led and authored as part of the Roadmap to Reform. Um, there are lots of things going on in the state of Victoria uh, to uh, 
to endeavour to continually refine and improve our system so we can reduce the numbers of children coming into care, but also for those that do come into care that we improve um, what's happening for them while they're in care and particularly residential care. And there has been quite a lot of new investment um, going into residential care here in Victoria from the November state budget that I'm sure Aguirre will touch on. So Aguirre is gonna speak about the key actions and initiatives to drive improved services and outcomes in residential care in Victoria. And I really hope that Aguirre got to hear some of the um, some of the insights from our CEOs before he jumped on to, um, to the meeting. So welcome Aguirre, it's always fun and really great to always have you with us on these really important occasions where um, yeah, this, this, this initiative is um, signals um, something really, really important um, that we, we're all gonna focus on over the next couple of years. Thank you, Deb. Um, lovely to be here. Can I um, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting? I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and any elders who are with us here today. I acknowledge the ongoing connection that Aboriginal people have to this land and recognise Aboriginal people as the original custodians of this land. Can I also recognise those Aboriginal colleagues who are with us um, today in this forum? Um, as Deb said, my name's Aguirre Alessandradas. Um, uh, new department, Deb, some old faces still here, continuing to work closely with um, all of you on these important initiatives. And um, thank you all for joining us for the launch of the Residential Care Sector Occupational Health and Safety Capability Program. Uh, can I make a special welcome um, to all our residential care staff, who are joining us today and acknowledge the enormous contribution you make each day to the lives of children and young people across our state. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have so many of us together um, today to focus on our shared priority to improve the health and safety of residential care workers and the children and young people they care for each day. I'd also like to acknowledge the other presenters we've been hearing from today, Colin Radford, Chief Executive of WorkSafe Victoria and Tony Carden, uh, WorkSafe Victoria Senior Ergonomist, uh, who will lead us um, through uh, the keynote item. As well as our sector leaders, we heard from just now, um, Robin Miller, Paul McDonald, Adjunct Professor Muriel Bankblood and Georgie Dwyer. The Department of Families, uh, Fairness and Housing is pleased to be partnering with WorkSafe Victoria and the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare on this important project to promote the safety and well-being of residential care workers in Victoria. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Deb Tabaras and the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare for bringing us together to mark the launch of this important program and for the very deep and enduring partnership uh, between the Centre and the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Deb and the Centre play a critical role in advocating for the interests of vulnerable children and families, supporting the sector and developing capability across our children and families workforces. I'd also like to call out the Centre and Deb's role in championing and driving our long-term service system reforms through the Roadmap for Reform to improve the life outcomes of Victorian children, young people and families. As you know, Victoria is undertaking a fundamental reshaping and transformation of the child and family system to work in a more client-centred and evidence-informed way with a focus on the long-term outcomes of children and families. I'll be speaking to you today about some of the key reforms currently underway with a focus on care services and residential care, including some uh, very new initiatives supported through the 2021 state budget. There's nothing more important than protecting children and young people from neglect and abuse and making sure that children who are un un unable to remain in their family home are well supported to recover from trauma meet their developmental needs and to thrive. As you know, children and young people in residential care are some of the most vulnerable in our community. We have a statutory obligation to ensure their safety and a particular commitment to provide stability and a nurturing environment conducive to their healing and recovery from trauma. But just as importantly, 
we have an obligation to support the safety and well-being of our residential care workers. Residential care workers play a vital role in our service system, supporting children and young people in uh, what are often um, some extremely challenging situations. For example, over the past year, as we have worked to respond to the coronavirus pandemic, our residential care staff have been there on the front lines, supporting our children and young people admirably. While many of us uh, were shifting to home-based care, work residential care teams were on site helping the children and young people they care for to navigate the practical impacts, stress and, and anxiety of the pandemic. This can be challenging work and residential care staff do an incredible job. Many of the children and young people you work with have experienced very significant trauma early in their life. Many will exhibit challenging behaviours that are the consequence of that trauma. We will agree they deserve the best support we can provide. But at the same time, we need to be equally clear that every single employee in the residential care system should expect to be safe at work. Over the past few years, the department has worked with the sector to implement a range of initiatives to improve the level of care provided to children and equip residential care staff with the resources they need to do their job. This includes improving safety and supervision through the overnight safety plans and establishing minimum qualification requirements for our residential care workers. The Residential Care Sector Occupational Health and Safety Capability Program that we are launching today is part of that journey and our shared commitment to improve health and safety for everyone across the system. It's about building leadership capability and understanding strategies to prevent occupational violence and aggression across all levels of our system. Our care services system and the outcomes we hope to support in the lives of children and young people is only as strong as the staff and carers on whom it depends. And so your safety and well-being are absolutely critical and are, the, are a precondition to providing the best possible care for children and young people. More broadly, the department is working with organisations right across the spectrum of community services to build the focus on quality and safety and with continued implementation of the community services quality governance framework. Effective quality governance is a cornerstone of safe, effective, connected and person-centred community services for everybody, every time. And the quality governance framework outlines the roles and responsibilities we all have at every level of the system to keep people who use our services safe from preventable harm. Similarly, we all have a role in developing a positive work culture where priority is placed on the health, safety and well-being of workers. This means ensuring workers can access training tools and support to best equip them to fulfil their important role. And that feedback is sought and used to improve the outcomes for children and families and enrich the professional environment for our staff. It also means ensuring a safe and fair workplace based on a just and learning culture with systems in place to address issues with culture. Another example of work underway to really deep, deeply engage with the residential care workforce is our partnership with the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and Safer Care Victoria um, called Improving Care in the uh, Victorian Residential uh, Services System. The improvement method that um, IHI will teach us through this part partnership has had a lot of success in really important areas of healthcare and in community services overseas. And we're excited about the opportunity to learn more about it and apply it in our residential care environment. This method starts by truly listening to those who are, who are at the front line, those who are in the best position to know what is working well and to understand where the opportunities are before deciding on next steps and the areas of focus, an approach we often strive for but don't always achieve. I know every one of you will have ideas about how we should be sharing the wealth of knowledge and skills that exist in residential care. 
And you will also know what needs to change in the system to clear the way for fundamental improvement, the kind that truly makes a difference um, and, and one that lasts. You'll be hearing more about this initiative in coming weeks, including the different ways you can be involved and contribute. I really encourage you all to be involved and share your unique insights. I mentioned before um, that our work with the sector and the centre to transform our child and family services system um, is work that we've been doing through the Roadmap for Reform Agenda. A core objective of this reform is to set the system up to work earlier and more effectively with families, to build safety and wellbeing and to keep families safely together. The focus is on earlier intervention and prevention, be it through early help for families with some emerging challenges or targeted and specialist support for those with greater needs, including a strong focus on intensive family preservation and restoration. But our reforms also understand that some children will need to live away from the family home. Within that framework, the continuing care pathway is about providing stability enabling healing and supporting a strong transition to independent adulthood for children and young people living outside of their family home. Residential care services are a critical element of that continuing care pathway. And our reform focus is on supporting residential services to provide intensive therapeutic care that support healing and skill development and enable transition to a low acuity placement, a family home or independent adulthood. The 2021 state budget included some major investments in the continu continuing care pathway that really accelerate our roadmap for reform system transformation. Investments that enhance the residential care system and extend and create tailored service responses for children and young people. Some of the highlights of that investment include 85.9 million over three years and 45.4 million for capital investment to build an additional 25 two and three bedroom houses for children uh, with complex needs in residential care. This is a great opportunity to provide more flexi flexibility in the system to enable placement matching and much needed improvements to the physical environment that provide better safety for young people living in residential care and the staff who look after them. There is also 9 million over two years to support the trial of care hubs, a new short-term intensive assessment and planning response to ensure early placement matching and stability. Care hubs will target new entrants to care, including sibling groups. The new response will meet the needs of children quickly and effectively, including a focus on reuniting families earlier. The 2021 state budget also invested $90.2 million over three years for the continuation and expansion of targeted care packages that provide an individualised response to support young people to prevent entry into residential care and support children's transition from residential care to home-based care where possible. Another initiative I'd like to call out is our investment of $15.9 million over four years to expand the successful Keep Embracing Your Success or Keys program, which provides intensive time-limited treatment for children with complex and needs. Keys is our new model of residential care, which brings together mental health um, and care services to provide a wraparound service that includes support for emotional regulation, mental health, and drug and alcohol issues. An evaluation of the KEYS program has demonstrated its effectiveness with a reduction in challenging behaviours and an improvement in mental health for most children involved. Finally, the state budget also provided 64.7 million to make the landmark home stretch program universal and ongoing, extending state care and supports for care leavers from 18 to 21. I think that's a, a very exciting change, which will make a huge difference to the lives of many young people in care services and an achievement that we can all be proud of um, in terms of what it will mean to uh, young people who will transition out of um, the out-of-home care system. 
So in closing, we have some great reform initiatives on the go that will lead to improved outcomes for children and families and will enrich the professional environment for staff across the system. However, as I said, the well-being of our staff must be at the forefront of our efforts. Our system depends on you and the work you do each day. We all have a role in developing a positive work culture with priorities placed on the health, safety and well-being of our residential care workers. It is fantastic to see this important program launched today and to see so many of us here to support it. I encourage you all to be actively involved as the program develops. Together, we can make a real difference. We can support each other and together better understand and implement what is needed to prevent occupational violence and aggression in the residential care sector. So on that note, I'll close out. And again, thank you all for inviting me to join you today and for the opportunity to speak. And thanks to each and every one of you for the work you do each day to support some of the most vulnerable children and young people in our community. Thank you, and I'll throw it back to you, Deb. Thank you, Agiri. That was a fantastic overview of what's happening. And I just want to say once again, please pass on my thanks to Beth and Michelle Chico, who are, are our partners in this initiative. Um, and, and, and we will work really hard to align this initiative with Simone Corinne's work that Agiri touched on so that it's not um, in any way confusing and it indeed isn't, but we'll we'll make sure that we um, align all these pieces so that they, they make good sense. And there will be opportunities um, to to um, pick up on some of the questions that you've raised in the Q&A as we develop the first stages of this initiative. And I know there's lots to talk to Igiri about in terms of the operations of residential care, how decisions are made that um, can be in the best interest of the child and the worker. So there's lots to talk about that actually shifts the, shift not only uh, the way we work, but what we're doing in residential care. And we all want that change so that every worker and every child, well, particularly that children thrive, but workers don't um, have a PD that um, expects them to be hit when the hit or hurt when they go to work. So we're on that journey and uh, and with uh, um, DFF as an investor in that, we feel we feel really confident. So thank you, Agiri, and it's always a pleasure to work with you. And thanks for making the time to come along today. Thanks, Deb. Um, what I might do now is I just think it's really important when we ask you to participate in an exercise that we throw up some of um, the slides. Now, I am told Slido's been going off um, and that we've got hundreds of responses and we obviously don't have time to put them all up, but I wanted to put up a couple. I think this slide probably um, is a really important slide because actually it's about retaining our, our really great residential workers. We had the wonderful Angela Porus, um, one of our residential care managers speaking before uh, about her work and the passion she has for her work and, and, and the passion that residential care workers have for their work, the important relationships they have with kids. Um, and this is just a slide that talks about retaining staff. So what are some of the benefits of changing our behaviour and attitudes towards OVA? Well, we then can retain our, our wonderful staff. And here are some of the, the sort of the few words that people put up through Slido, more proactive support. Um, support, st support staff to be able to support kids properly, nobody getting hurt, training and upskilling, staff will remain longer, cultural change, increased awareness, increased reporting, hopefully leading to reduction in incidents, better outcomes for children, safety, less violence, reduction in work cover claims, healing, um, stabilising our workforce. Now, this is a really fantastic slide because it epitomises what we would like to see change if we reduce the amount of OVA in the workplace. And look, we are focusing on OVA between ch children and workers, but you know, um, one of the things that's really critical from a centre's point of view is to look to reduce violence between children because it's, it's a very big issue, as we know, in residential care. So some of the potential... Um, opportunities to influence that are, are really critical. So um, I might, I might, we, we'll let that play for a bit longer um, in terms of some of the things that reduce staff burnout, establishing a standard and setting ground rules, a stronger, safer workforce, 
really fantastic slide. It's a really good picture of what we're trying to do here. Um, so we might take that slide down. I just want to say once again, some of the questions that have come up are a bit tricky to answer whilst we're in session, but I I guarantee you the team will get back to you with answers to some of those questions. And this is just the launch. So there are going to be lots of sessions to really dissect what's happening around OVA and some of the things that we need to go uh, do going forward, but also how that's going to influence the safety leadership programs that we're going to be rolling out across the state. So lots of opportunities at every level of our workforce and our leadership to be able to um, have some engagement. So thank you for that. And thank you for participating in Slido. It's always a really, it's always great to have a look at the data that we, we get from that. And um, we didn't want to have you um, just sitting and listening. We wanted to be able to have you participating. So um, we now move into the second session. So we've had um, absolutely fantastic um, input from WorkSafe, from DHHS and from our sector leadership. And also from Angela, as I said, one of our fantastic leaders in residential care. Now we move into the second session, which is a bit of um, what, what I would call a bit of training. Hey, Tony, a bit of knowledge building for those that don't have this knowledge. I suspect people do have some of this knowledge, but this might be a way for people to spend a little bit of time fine tuning that knowledge. Um, Tony, Dr. Tony Carden is a senior ergonomist. I think I got it right this time. Um, uh, and um, and um, works in the Human Factors Unit at WorkSafe Victoria. Tony has a diverse range of work experience across a wide range of industry sectors, including housing construction, electricity distribution, property maintenance, security, outdoor education, and adventure guiding. Wow, Tony. Uh, Tony's current work centres on supporting the learning and applications of systems across WorkSafe and Victorian workplaces. Uh, Dr. Carden is speaking to us today on applying a systems framework in addressing OVA in the residential care sector. So, Tony, that's that's a really interesting connection between the work that you've done and our residential care workforce. So I'm really looking forward to how you've you've drawn those connections for us and really looking forward to hearing from you. So over to you. Thank you, Deb. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be a part of the WorkSafe team contributing to this uh, important project. And I just want to check, maybe you can confirm for me, Deb, that people can see my screen that I'm sharing. I can certainly see your screen, Tony. Wonderful. Um, Thank you. Can we see a few other people saying they can um, they can hear the screen, see the screen? Yes. Loads of Wonderful. hands raising. Fantastic. That's a good start. Thank you. And I'd also like to begin by uh, acknowledging the Wurundjeri people from whose land I'm speaking to you uh, today, uh, and in particular to pay respects to Wurundjeri uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, it's been fascinating to hear uh, the comments of speakers so far this morning, uh, and I noticed a, a, an interesting theme emerging. Uh, Muriel spoke about um, the loss of respect by young people due to the system having failed them. Um, Colin, my uh, colleague and CEO, spoke about people at different levels of the system. Argery too uh, mentioned people at different levels of the system. Uh, and it reminds me of a of a well-used phrase in, in my area that bad systems will defeat good people every day. And there's clearly no lack of good people and goodwill uh, in the residential out-of-home care sector. Um, what I hope we can contribute to is improving the design of the system. Uh, so Paul talked about the importance of shared understanding, and I hope this presentation will be a step along a path toward that shared understanding. Uh, so what I offer to you now uh, is a brief tour of the underpinning approach that we at WorkSafe are bringing to the table um, through this partnership, uh, and it's known as systems thinking. So I'm going to start with a bit of myth busting. Um, there are a number of common myths about both safety and systems thinking. Let's look at some of them. Here are a few in relation to safety. One common myth is that workplace safety is an absence of accidents. Another is that workplace safety is zero incident reports. A third is that workplace workplace safety is when there is no possibility of human error. A fourth is that works, workplace safety is about compliance. And a fifth one is that workplace safety is just about common sense. 
On the morning of April 18th, 2010, a high-profile VIP group of executives from BP arrived from Houston, Texas by helicopter uh, to the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. They were there to participate in a management visibility tour, which, among other things, would celebrate the rig's safety record of seven years of drilling without a single lost time incident. Two days later, on April the 20th, a massive explosion ripped apart the Deepwater Horizon, killing 11 workers, injuring 16 others and causing massive environmental damage. A history of low accident numbers didn't mean that the workplace was safe because underlying this were many mechanical failures, staff shortages and breakdowns, all leading to a catastrophic incident. Rather than focusing on lost time incidents, the executives could have been focusing on a number of unresolved maintenance requests, the number of unresolved hazards that were reported that would have given them a better picture of what was going on across the system. Second myth, workplace safety being zero incident reports. Workers tend only to report incidents when they feel safe to report. This is especially true of occupational violence and aggression. The indicator of a strong safety culture is reporting of minor and near miss events. Increasing incident reporting can often be the first aim of a safety culture program as it indicates people feel safe to speak up. Researchers that I know tell a story of arriving at a workplace to see a worker with his leg in a, a full cast sitting in the office. The workplace, which had aimed for zero incidents and reported lost uh, zero time, uh, zero lost time incidents, sorry, had uh, um, uh, influenced this injured man rather than taking time off to take on administrative work instead. Uh, thus maintaining uh, their ability to continue reporting zero lost time incidents. Third myth, workplace safety is when there's no possibility of human error. Well, a workplace system that relies on the people in it never to make a mistake is poorly designed. Um, human capabilities and limitations are at this stage of the game well understood. We humans are adaptable, we're creative, and we all occasionally make mistakes. A work system that relies on the people in it to never make a mistake is poorly designed. Simply adding policies and procedures doesn't really change this reality. Uh, procedures can't predict all of the situations that can emerge at work. When work demands and systems change, procedures often don't keep up. When following procedures seems too expensive, time consuming, too much work or unsafe, people are likely to find shortcuts or workarounds. Remembering and following all details of procedures 100% of the time is usually unachievable. And this is another common myth, a final common myth for safety, that it's about common sense. But in reality, people tend to do what makes most sense to them at the time. The judgment about a lack of common sense uh, is usually only made with the benefit of hindsight after something go goes wrong. Um, and what actually are common sense behaviours? My common sense might be your absurdity. This idea of common sense wrongly assumes that safety or the lack of it results only from the actions of people at the coalface. The safety or the lack of it results from the decisions and actions of people at all levels of the system. So to summarise a few of these myths uh, and the realities, uh, there's the myth that workplace safety is an absence uh, of accidents. The reality is this, workplace safety is when we can identify when things are going right versus when they're going wrong so that we can pre prevent catastrophic failures or any failures. Workplace safety is zero incident reports. Well, the reality is actually that workplace safety is when there's a culture where workers feel safe to report hazards, near misses and incidents. Workplace safety, no human error, well, not really. Workplace safety is when workers are valued rather than seen as the problem. Workers are problem solvers. Workplace safety being compliance with procedures. The reality is that workplace safety is when workers, supervisors and managers can all adapt and are supported to adapt, adapt to unforeseen situations. And finally, workplace safety, just common sense. It's actually when everyone understands their role and responsibilities in maintaining safety in the workplace. Systems thinking. So systems thinking is one of these things that's increasingly being bandied around and applied, um, but it also is subject to some myths. 
here's one of them. Um, systems thinking is just about policies and procedures. We have good administrative systems. Systems thinking is some kind of incident reporting system or other uh, IT system. Some people use the phrase to mean that they're just being systematic, that they do things in a, in a logical way. Closely related to that is the idea that systems thinking is the same as critical thinking, i.e. that we, uh, we check our beliefs and we seek external evidence and update our beliefs uh, according to evidence. That's important to do. Critical thinking is essential, but it's not the same as systems thinking. Um, and a cynical view that systems, systems thinking is a management fad, it can be misused in that way, but in fact, when well understood, is a really, really powerful tool for uh, addressing uh, occupational health and safety, and in our case, occupational violence and aggression. So how can systems thinking improve oh and um, There's a number of good metaphors, good visual metaphors for uh, systems thinking. This is one of them. The iceberg shows that there are the things that are obvious above the surface of the water, but then there are layers of uh, hidden parts of the work system um, below the surface. And they're hidden generally because they actually exist at a distance in time and space from when and where the work happens. So let's have a bit of a look and a chat about uh, what systems thinking is. Systems thinking, in my view, is really a way of understanding that systems of work are formally complex systems. The good news is that complex doesn't have to mean difficult. Complex systems are just systems that have different characteristics from non-complex systems. And they include things like uh, non-linearity, which is the similar to the well-known butterfly effect where small causes can have large effects and vice versa. Um, emergence, which is where new things that weren't predicted or even predictable can arise from interactions between any combination of things in the system. Um, similarly, non-determinism, you can't ever fully predict the future state of the system because of its nature. On the good side, uh, complex systems tend to self-organise and to be adaptive. And finally, an important thing to recognise about complex systems, which include all systems of work, is that they're, they're, they're changing, ever-changing. They're porous, they have fuzzy boundaries, things enter and leave the system on short and longer timescales, and therefore they need to not be static. They need to be adaptable and flexible. Um, and this is particularly the case in uh, residential out-of-home care in relation to uh, the people who work uh, and who are residents in out-of-home care. There's a lot of people coming and going um, and other changes to the work system. Dealing with safety has evolved over time. So this picture illustrates the evolution of thinking about uh, work systems roughly over the past 100 years. And you can see at the model there, that green sequential model idea started back in the early, early 20th century where it was thought that when something went wrong, there was a single root cause and generally the root cause was a person. And the solution for that was you either discipline or remove that person, problem solved. After some decades of trying that approach and finding that it wasn't very successful in the mid 20th century, people started to think that there could be multiple lines of root causes, parallel lines, if you like, of root causes. And that's led to uh, notions like the Swiss cheese model and, and other variants on the idea that there are multiple lines of, of causes of things that go wrong in a system. Um, and if you can backtrack along those lines, you can identify the multiple problems in the system and fix them all. The more contemporary recognition uh, in in modern safety science and OHS is that actually work systems are not uh, fixed systems. They're not mechanical, they're not clockwork. And in fact, they are more like, in fact, they are ecological systems where complex things happen. And so we need to apply a different way of understanding those systems in order to be able to manage them effectively. This framework, uh, you don't, there won't be a test at the end, but Rasmussen's risk management framework offers a wonderful way of understanding systems of work. And so on the left there, you can see six levels of a work system from government down through regulators, uh, senior company management, uh, 
middle middle management, the staff and the work, and then the environment they work in. The eyeball-looking diagram on the right, the main thing to take away from that is that within the middle of that eyeball, the squiggly line represents the freedom of action of people. And that's an important thing to recognise, that no matter what procedures, policies, laws and regulations we put around work, people are actually free to act as they act in the moment in response to what's happening around them and do. Uh, around that eyeball, we have constant barriers of uh, economic pressure, workload pressure, and then on the right, there is a safety boundary. What we want to try to do is to keep people uh, safely working within that central area so that they can adapt and move and work uh, as they need to, but in a safe way and in a way that's viable um, for the aims of what they're trying to do. Using that framework, um, there are a number of different models that we use uh, in this project and others. Uh, this is one of them. It's called an AxiMap. The AxiMap is a way of modelling accidents and incidents using that risk management framework with the different levels. The important thing here is to see that when an incident occurs, and we can think of this as a, uh, an occupational violence and aggression incident, there will always have been multiple causal and contributing factors. So elements at different levels of the system will always have contributed to an adverse outcome. Another useful tool, you won't be able to read the fine print on that, but this is a, a model also based on uh, that framework, um, it's a control model and it shows the standing controls, the different actors at different levels of a work system and the arrows between them will represent the types of control that they have. So that's the downward arrows. And importantly, upward arrows will represent lines of feedback. Uh, and we call when there are good channels of uh, communication of control going down through a system and really good channels of feedback coming up through a system, when that's all working really well, uh, it's, we call that being vertically integrated. And that's a good sign when you have good channels in both directions, which allows the system to adapt to change, uh, again, at short and long time scales. Some of the preliminary work we've done uh, on this project includes this identification of uh, actors that corresponds with the two models I've just shown you uh, in the residential care sector. Again, you won't be able to read the fine print, um, but you will get a sense that there are many actors, uh, many agencies and types of people in the system that contribute to um, both the presence or, or absence in the cases where it's absent of safety in residential out home care. So in residential care, work-related violence is created by decisions and actions of all actors across the system, not just frontline workers. Uh, work-related violence is caused by multiple contributing factors, never just a single poor decision or action. Uh, violence can result from poor communication and feedback, as I just mentioned, uh, through levels of the system and not just from deficiencies at one level. Behaviours aren't static. They change, they migrate uh, under the influence of what's happening in the moment and what's happening in the person's life and many other factors. Migration of practices causes defences to degrade and erode gradually over time. So what's a safe system? I want to put to you that this is a definition of a safe system. Um, system think thinking can support a safe system uh, by providing design insights uh, that allow systems to become resilient, adaptive, and that make it easier for people in the system to do safe things uh, than to do unsafe things. And there are some contact details for me. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Please contact me at any stage if you'd like to discuss any of this afterwards, but I believe that we might now have some time for a bit of Q&A, Deb. Thank you, Dr. Tony. That's fantastic. Pleasure. I really liked your images. I love a good sort of cartoon image or um, at the beginning of a presentation. I'm a visual person, so that really appeals to me. We've had lots of requests for the uh, for the PowerPoint too, Tony, so I hope that's okay that we can, we can, we can turn that on. Uh, because um, a lot of us know this stuff, 
but we also don't always know the theory behind it. It's a sort of a gut feeling. So it's always really I think good that's to right. know, yeah, the, the concrete um, why we do it um, from a theoretical point of view. So so thank you for that. Now, um, I'm looking at the q and I'm trying to get some guidance from my people about, uh, yes, mostly they want the slides, Tony, to be honest. We haven't actually got any any questions up there yet. Um, but we've, we've um, oh, here we go. Here's some, here's some things that have come up. Some so sort of the top 12 questions. So we might have a little bit. Um, what, this is an interesting one. Why is this program restricted to just residential care? Lead tenant programs face the same issues with less structural support um, around them. Now I can answer that, Tony, um, because basically this is the beginning of something. I would totally agree with you. Um, I'm, you know, I'm expecting what we're going to be doing together is going to work, and then we can look at the application of this. Um, across our service system, um, but the urgency, um, having having presented that data really early on in my presentation today, is in our residential care settings. But I totally agree with you, anonymous, uh, that actually that's something that we should be considering over time. And here's another one: How do we apply the work safe safety work safe hierarchy of control when investigating OVA when the Department of Health, the old Department of Health and Human Services guidelines state that restrictive practice is the last resort. So it's an interesting question, Tony. Um, so there's a, often a conflict. Yes, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah, and it's it's something in, in some of the research we've done in partnership with many people who I believe will be uh, on the on the Zoom today. Yeah. Um, we've detected this, that there's often confusion around uh, the hierarchy of constraints at the upper level, let me say. So an example is, if there seems to be a conflict between uh, privacy law and safety law, for example, if uh, there's known risks about a resident who's being transferred from one facility to another, should we pass on that knowledge to the receiving facility or is that a breach of their rights or of privacy law? So my understanding uh, informed by our legal folk at WorkSafe is that the safety uh, requirements and the safety needs take precedence. Um, and so I know that some of this misunderstanding is deeply embedded and, and I hope that through partnership and working through these issues and getting clarity around what the actual system looks like. And so remember that those top levels of the system that I illustrated there are indeed the legal and regulatory parts once we are all on a same page about how they connect to each other, I think there'll be greater clarity about those sorts of uh, dilemmas. Holy Tony, and um, um, one of my colleagues, one of um, one of the uh, um, the large uh, residential care providers leaders, was talking to me on text saying we really do need to have a look at how the system that is our operational department of FFH works as decision makers. Um, in relation to the work that we do. So there's the system stuff is really important when it comes to our operational divisions and the sorts of things they might ask us to do that probably aren't going to work for children and probably create violence. So there's there's that that's going to be really critical in this project to unpack that. Um, so here's some other ones. Um, there was one before I just saw that was talking about we have lots of fantastic uh, publicity about um, on, on TV now about um, protecting our Help, uh, frontline health workforces and preventing violence against those workforces. Why don't we have that in residential care? Well, watch this space because you never know. Um, with this project, maybe we'll be able to do something. Like, maybe not TV ads, but maybe something that um, starts to um, create a story in the public eye about how valuable these workers are. Um, there was one here about um, training. Now, of course, training of our residential care workers has been an ongoing um, conversation with some initiatives such as a minimum qualification uh, starting a few years ago. But as we work through the residential care action plan, we might need to think about, well, what, what, what's the next step we need to go? There's a minimum qualification and, the, and, and, it, and we also want, we want people who are experienced and supported, as Robin talked about, really good supervision. But what's the next stage that we need to go to to have the sort of workforce that, that can, uh, um, can have the right skills and capabilities? We've got some brilliant workers um, across our sector, but what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean and now look like to have a skilled and trained workforce going forward? I think it's a conversation to be had. 
Maybe if I might, I, I just note on that that absolutely critical as it is to have um, have an excellent workforce and a well trained workforce. I'd note that you know the implementation of, as you've just mentioned, of training guidelines, but going further up and out in the system to facility design guidelines and indeed the 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 um, introduction of two bedroom units. You know the design of the physical environment is really important. The uh, notwithstanding my comments about not relying too much on policy and procedure, having good policy and procedure is essential, as, as is having good legislation, good resourcing, good budgeting, both at a departmental and a treasury level. All of those things are factors in the system that either support safety or not. That's so true, Tony. We've got a couple of questions here um, and um, you, you may or may not be able to answer them, but they're, they're worth putting out there. What system, this is from Philip Yu, what systems mentioned work well for human facing services that run 24 hour like services, like 24 hour? So, I mean, there are lots out there, aren't there? There's disability services, aged care. Yep. Are there specific context factors which make OVA in residential care more likely to occur than in other 24 hour programs? So, there's some comparator. I would say yes on the face of it, given the nature of the work and, and the the people, the young people who are being cared for, we know that. And uh, one one element of the system is good methods for assessing and communicating risk and mitigating risk. Um, the other thing that leaps to me out of that question is around fatigue. The role of fatigue for workers is an important one, uh, acknowledging it and building in um, systems to, to keep workers safe in relation to fatigue. We know that uh, people exceeding thresholds of fatigue are uh, diminished in their decision-making capabilities and other capabilities in much the same way as if they were drug or alcohol affected. So it's important to have rostering systems uh, and again, uh, industrial uh, systems in place to support workers to not run the risk of being fatigued. Um, but indeed, again, those broader system factors to do with facility design, um, are, are critical as well. Yeah, I mean, the fatigue stuff does come, especially come up during COVID, Tony. I think that's a really important one to single out. And these are high concentration jobs. You know, you really, uh, and we rely heavily on these workers. They're very, it's very intense work. But this is another really terrific question. How do we move to a more collaborative approach to care rather than um, an often adversarial and blame-based approach which often is the first dance when incidents occur. So an incident occurs, and as you would know, Tony, you work at WorkSafe, everybody's looking for somebody to blame. You know, yeah. it's not, and I'm sure that's not the intention, but, you know, these things can elicit panic. Um, so Indeed. panic in terms of the safety of the person who have been harmed, but also, you know, trying to calm everything down, like what's actually happened here and not, not yeah. blame. If you've got some comments on that, because... We really need to shift that, don't we? If we're going to get any, if we're going to get anywhere. I think so, Deb. It's uh, it's well recognised across uh, many industries and sectors, uh, and and the remedy to it, there is a remedy to it that comes out of human factors known as just culture, and just culture is a a subset of safety culture that says that you need to uh, develop a culture where uh, not only is it okay, it's really encouraged to uh, report on and discuss safety issues and safety concerns and indeed to acknowledge your own errors when you've made them and that when an error uh, has been made that there is a just method justice in the sense of justice of dealing with when errors are made so people can feel confident that they won't be treated unfairly if they've done the wrong thing inadvertently uh, and where those sorts of cultures have been implemented and critically supported by leadership um, that has led to significant improvements in reporting and then to significant improvements in safety. Mm, that's that's really helpful because I think that, you know, um, where there's fear and look, um, work workplaces generally, I mean, we've all, you know, we've all worked in a variety of workplaces over the years. The, the, it is really, it is really challenging to calm that down when something really terribly goes wrong. Everybody's panicked. So I'm um, Note that the, the other important part, Deb, is, is post-incident counselling for all concerned. Uh, the sorts of incidents you're 
talking about are, are emotionally traumatic regardless uh, and uh, well as well as any physical outcome there's ine inevitably psychosocial harm caused in those incidents so there need to be immediate supports to deal with that as well I'm going to go to this last question because I think it's a systems question, and then I'm I'm going to I'm going to go back to the um, the one at the top here because I've got a couple. This one is really this you know the, always the challenging one. So how will the work of a program work to align um, when you have conflicting policies and procedures for the funder versus the deliverer? So. Um, how do we how do we align those things now i'm i'm fairly confident that through this initiative we're going to be able to have those conversations because it's going to become obvious where there's a misalignment between uh, the funder and what they want and the deliverer in terms of perhaps a misalignment in decision making um what's your experience in in that in that tony what would your observations be because there are you know there is always there, there is often misalignment between the intentions of the funder and and the deliverer and those things can be quite quite difficult can't they it can be deb and i've encountered it in many settings and and i'm always reminded of the old parable of the the blind men and the elephant each each of whom is feeling a different part of the element elephant and each of whom is convinced it's a different thing and it's it's simply a case of um people having different perspectives on the system. And I do hope that through this project, by building a, a shared collective big picture, a holistic picture of the system, uh, a same page for everybody to be on, um, the, uh, the likelihood of that kind of conflict should uh, reduce as it has in many other domains where this approach has been applied. Yeah, and I think that for, I mean, Robin Miller said it earlier that, you know, at the heart of this sometimes decisions are made about placing children in units where they they don't feel safe and they harm others yeah. um, and you know really we need to have a mature conversation about those very early decisions about what children need uh, before placement occurs so we prevent all of this and um, it, it can be at the heart of some of these things but working with our funding body with in you know, a department of FFH I am sure that we can um, you know, well, we will be required to have those conversations now. So that's that's really great. Um, and this last one here, you will have come across this. Often, um, unit coordinators, managers uh, are trying to supervise. They're they're trying to supervise staff and manage the children and the other staff. So that important role of uh, creating a team, creating a safety culture, doing one-on-one -on -one supervision with a, with teams, build that culture. What's your advice about, so some of it's about resources um, and some of it's about training and some of it's about a whole lot of other things. What would you, what would, what, what have you seen in other settings that's been useful for people to sort of appreciate, for managers to appreciate and for leaders and workers to appreciate? What I've seen succeed in other settings uh, to address that kind of challenge is to, to get all of the uh, relevant people to, the, to a table together um, so that includes those workers and those managers, along with the decision makers above them, and have a really creative conversation around what would work. So actually have a design conversation with all of the people affected. Uh, and through those conversations, often there'll be a combination of, uh, a bit like the previous question, a greater understanding of the elephant. Um, and that can lead to shifts from both ends and from all perspectives, in fact, on what's realistic and, and will better achieve uh, the aims. Uh, but the essential part is the process where there are forums for conversation, people can feel heard, be heard, and the system can be adapted according to need. It's it's the enactment of that vertical integration I mentioned during the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. And I think that um, building teams, supporting staff is, is actually essential. I mean, it's, it's, it's critical to the success of anything. And I think that um, um, these are going to need to be ongoing conversations, I think, about how we, we build those structures and processes where they are, don't exist. In some places they do. And how we learn from each other in order to sort of systematise them and enculturate them. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, great off-the-cuff answers to some really um, 
some some tough questions. So thank you, Tony. I really, really appreciate your time. And um, um, I'm sure we'll be working with you again in the future. So some of those, Pleasure. your ability to app apply learnings from other systems and other sectors is really valuable. Um, because, you know, sometimes looking out before you look in can be really, really helpful. So thank you, Tony. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. So I'm going to wrap us up. Look, we've had there's been so much comment on Slido. There's lots in the in the um, lots of questions in Slido. There's been lots of questions on chat. We will take those things away and endeavour to come back to people um, with some 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 Q and A's to answer some of those things so that you're not left not having your question answered. We hate one of the things we hate at the centre is somebody takes the um, you know, answers a question, ask a question, we want to be able to try and answer it. So we always feel a little uncomfortable about closing that off. I really want to thank everybody today. I particularly, of course, want to thank um, the over 240 people who joined us today. We're still now up to 190. So there is high levels of engagement on this issue. I really want to thank uh, my colleagues in the sector, the CEOs who run these, um, you know, really challenging services, the team leaders, the coordinators and the workers who do the most remarkable job and remember, uh, did the most remarkable job during COVID and we are still in COVID. So it's both an ethical, moral and absolute issue that we do something about this because Every, you know, these workers have continued to do it, to do it tough. I want to thank WorkSafe um, as a major sponsor, major sponsor of today's launch. I want to thank um, the Department of um, Families, Fairness and Housing, I will get it right eventually, for, um, for their support on this initiative. But I want to remind people, um, as Paul said, we're at the cusp of something here. We're only at the beginning. We know there's a problem. We know we want to fix it. But along the way, there'll be other things we're going to need to fix. But this is a, a you know, an, a, a sort of an opportunity to do something that we haven't been able to do before. I'm really grateful for the honesty. The honesty is in the question. The honesty in um, in the the conversations the CEOs have had today. Um, I um, I I, uh, I a shout out to Angela Paul, fantastic manager of Resi, um, positive, inspiring. Uh, uh, honest talk. Um, thank you for being here, Angela, and, um, and we'll be in touch because you'd be a fantastic ambassador for this initiative. Um, um, and, and thank you to um, my team for putting on, for, for making this happen. Must say, um, there's complexities with this project and with the, the the partnership arrangement that everybody worked on to make this happen. And, and Emma Fembi, uh, Emma Chua and Oliver, thank you for making um, today seamless. Um, this is, um, uh, you know, this is, as I said, the beginning of something. So thank you. And I can see Josephine there from WorkSafe. Thank you to you, Josephine, for being here to answer some of the tricky questions. Um, now, just in closing, on the 17th of March, uh, the uh, Works, WorkSafe and the Centre are putting on a return to work forum, the 17th of March. Um, an invitation to, to, to come to that will be um, will be sent to you. Please send whomever you like to um, to that um, it's to that um, initiative. Returning people to work after they've been harmed is really really hard, but really really important. Um, we had the fantastic Tony talking about systems and safety. I know that some of that I knew, but some of that I didn't know. So. These things are not basic. So I'm really, really glad to see that most people stayed to hear what Tony had to say. Um, and I just want to, you know, thank you all and, and close the session. So, um, yeah, thank you, Muriel, for your wise words and um, and for always giving the centre your wonderful support. Um, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>